shit. Well, hello, my fellow, um, men. Did you catch the new Dragon Ball Z episode? Okay, yeah, so you've probably got some questions, but, um, for me to really be able to answer those, we're gonna need a little bit of story, so why don't you join me for a little trip down memory lane? <laughs> Please remain on the marked path at all times. I got employee-only shit here, I don't need to see. Like the rest of you strapping young depressoids, my first exposure to anime was as a kid through good old Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh. Who's that Pokemon? It's kinda hot. <laughs> These shows were the fucking shit. And for a good reason. They had a story. I know, right? Fucking crazy, but it's true. Yeah, cartoons have a premise, but they reset at the end of each episode. Episodes are self-contained, and it's rare for one to spill over into the next, but with a running story like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! had, each episode builds on the last one, and you have this clear path from the first episode to the last one. You can swap episodes at Spongebob around just fine, but if you go swapping episodes of Yu-Gi-Oh!, great. You fucked it. I don't even want to watch it anymore. Episodic and serialized shows both have their pros and cons, but that's really the only difference there was between Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! and the cartoons at the time. Yu-Gi-Oh! in its original form probably would have had trouble getting network approval, but four kids made sure that it was neutered before they'd let it in the house. And in an era where Stimpy could pick his belly button enough to collapse in on it, and Mr. Meaty could... exist. You can't tell me that either of these shows were conceptually challenging. So really, the only advantage these shows had over cartoons were their serialized stories. But holy shit, was that all they needed. <gasps> Serialization opens the door for story and character arcs, which allows for more nuanced characterization and lets the viewers develop deeper emotional connections to the characters and their journeys. A running story also keeps viewers engaged since they come back every week to not miss any plot developments, not only helping maintain viewership numbers, but increasing the quality of that viewership as they have to watch more accurately to not miss plot points. Both these aspects were then capitalized on to launch a mass merchandising movement that reached heights that cartoon couldn't even dream of, and in the span of what felt like a single day, everyone you knew had become a professional trading card curator, and if your cards weren't cool enough, then guess what? <gasps> you were a fucking loser. The impact that these shows had changed playground dynamics forever, raising an entire generation of nerds. Their influence would only continue to grow as more serialized cartoons popped up in their wake. And while the cartoons at the time have fizzled into nostalgia, both Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! have remained huge global franchises with enough staying power that my friends and I still bring our card collections to show and tell. Oh! Sorry, I had another planes card. <laughs> <laughs> Yo! That's worthless! And I would be ignoring my civic duty as a storyteller if I didn't mention how Misty single-handedly jump-started a generation of puberty. Which, you could make the argument that that's Pokemon's greatest influence. Unfortunately, at the time, I suffered from the deadly combination of being a child and a fucking idiot, of which I've still only recovered from being a child, so I didn't know what the fuck a globalization was. As far as I knew, these were American cartoons hand-drawn by Uncle Sam himself. But whatever they were, I knew that I really liked them, and I wanted more. And more I got. I remember going to my grandma's daycare after school one day and watching the Toonami promo for that weekend's Naruto episode, just fucking wide-eyed watching Naruto and Haku fight over Sasuke's dead body while the toddlers were in the back room having nap time with Wow Wow Wubsy. <laughs> now this, this was fucking different. From the first episode, I could immediately tell that this was a step up from the Irish cartoon. I mean, just look at this shit! He just fucking killed that guy! And look at this fucking frame! You can't show this shit in a cartoon! You're supposed to cover it up with like a POW or something! Does the FCC know? Was I supposed to write my representative as an 8 year old? I mean... Uh... Oh. No, wait, hold on. I like this. Oh, I really like this. For better or worse, Okay, so for worse, Naruto has been a huge part of my life. I- I'm done. Dude, one of those was a fucking shinobi. I have so much ammo, <laughs> somebody please- Gavin, 
You've, You've made one thing. too many Naruto references for this day. You gotta stop. But why shouldn't I have been hooked on it? I was the target demographic, and this shit's fucking hype. The fights get your blood pumping, they fill you with adrenaline, put you on the edge of your seat. And the ability to tell a story through a fight is genuinely impressive. Really, Naruto is what led to me getting stuck only watching Battle Shonen later on, but we'll get to that after the time skip. If Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh piqued my interest in anime, Naruto lit a fire under my ass that burned hotter than when I piss. Why? Why? Why do I write this shit? I know I'm the one who has to end up reading it. One of the best cartoons growing up was Hey Arnold. Its characters were realistic people, it dealt with real problems, had sound life lessons, and it never talked down to the kids watching it. It knew when to be funny, and when to back off the humor to make room for the story so they didn't have to sacrifice either one to the other. Hey Arnold set the bar for the level of respect that I would expect from a cartoon, and while not every show hit the bar with as much grace as Hey Arnold, most of the cartoons I grew up with did still treat me how I wanted, but there were limits. Networks would overstep and deem things not appropriate for kids, and then they'd add restrictions. Cora and Asami aren't allowed to be gay. A Powerpuff Girls episode was pulled because... <clears throat> the metal beams in the destroyed buildings look too much like crosses, and that one of the hippies looked like Jesus? What? Is that real? Powerpuff Girls band episode. Oh my god, that's real? The biggest one, though, was that really, no one's allowed to die. Jet was only killed through implication, and then Terra had to be unkilled. But then Naruto comes in going, you said restrict what now? Here was a show aimed at kids that was comfortable with murdering people on screen and didn't feel the need to force in a joke into a serious scene just to ease the tension. Maybe if I was to kill the most important people in your life, everyone who's ever meant anything, maybe then you'd have some idea how I feel. Everyone you're talking about has already been killed. I've been around longer than you have, kid. Networks wanted to shield kids from shit like the concept of death, Ooh, But then Naruto's laughing and pointing back at a dead body like, <laughs> we just killed one of the most important figures in the show, isn't that awesome? And in the world of anime, you don't have to worry about networks blocking a lesbian relationship. Our women are our men! Naruto didn't want to hold my hand. It wanted to break it, shove a multi-tailed fox up my ass, and tell me that life isn't fair. And I wanted to let it. Hey Arnold may have made me feel like an adult watching it, but it simply couldn't compete. Naruto wasn't giving me some feel-good, be-a-good-person life lesson. No, it's telling me that the world sucks, and here's how hard you gotta work to make it. Tough shit. And by the way, did you know that animation could be so expressive? I didn't. The most animation I was used to was the outline on Ed, Ed, and Eddie characters. Now I'm getting graphic fights with detailed animation, choreography, and camera work that could last actual hours at a time. Not to mention with the emotional scenes, realizing how well you could describe a character's inner thoughts and feelings without a single word. You've done well for yourself. I'm very proud to be your father. Mm. Naruto really did open my eyes to the possibilities of animation. And goddamn, if Misty had me feeling some type of way, Anko was full on sensory overload. At some point around this time, I started watching the Adult Swim block too. Probably earlier than I should have been allowed to, but you know, my parents are cool, they say fuck sometimes, so they let it slide, and I was introduced to the world of adult animation. Why are we trying to cash a bill? Uh, what's happening, big guy? What's up with the guns? I gotta go take care of something. Some advice from Mr. Kelly. Next time, use a golden shower to curtain. You call me a homo? What? Yes, you are. Do I look like I know what a JPEG is? And, I don't know, man. Don't get me wrong, the show's undoubtedly got funnier, but it still felt like a step back in some ways. For starters, most of these shows went back to an episodic format, and while I'm not trying to say that either format's innately better than the other, Pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh! did open my eyes to serialized stories and cartoons, and that's just where my personal preference lies. Secondly, these shows sometimes felt like they didn't have the level of respect for me as a viewer that the cartoons for kids did. 
Like, hey, Arnold's teaching me when to grow up and when to stand my ground, while Family Guy's over here like, eh, hey, Lois, remember that time we had sex? Eh. If it's animation for adults, it should be able to handle those mature themes that cartoons weren't allowed to touch. And they do. I want to be fair, they absolutely do, but in my experience, the discussion only goes as far as it's funny. I rewatched the gun control episode of American Dad to see if there was any basis to my thoughts, and yeah, gun control is prevalent throughout the episode, obviously, but I mean, the show's a comedy. Any point it brings up, it has to do so in the context of a joke, and the show is so preoccupied with making fun of the caricature of Stan that it almost feels like it wouldn't mind if the takeaway was a Professor Oak-style approach to gun control. No witnesses. God? Meanwhile, Teen Titans Go! devoted an entire episode to teaching kids about rent control and building equity. So which one's really the adult cartoon? And there's times when these shows for adults dodge the same topics that the ones for kids do. I have Family Guy fucking unkilled Brian. Of course, I am generalizing here. These criticisms don't apply to every single adult cartoon. The Boondocks is littered with way too much social commentary to be lumped in, and King of the Hill is God's gift to this planet. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem's definitely gotten better with time, with shows like Rick and Morty and Bojack Horseman, but at the time it made more sense to me for anime to be animation for adults than anything the West was making. It still kinda does. I'd still watch the Adult Swim block every night, cause, I mean, come on, it's funny, I wanna laugh. But the Toonami block was always what I was really looking forward to. And just as a quick aside, the reason the Toonami block got moved to the weekend was because networks were like, yeah, no, kids cannot be seeing this. Now, even with how into Naruto I was, every good story needs a twist. And here's ours as we're coming up on a part of my life known as the Dark Zone. The Thickness Sector. Wow, that name is just better in every single way, but that is just straight false advertising for my love life. The Thickness Sector is a stretch of a good four to five years of my life where I legitimately watched no TV because I was, <clears throat> you know. Yeah, so, uh, I don't think there's really anything to talk about here, so, uh, by middle school. Hi, high school. Oh shit, I'm graduating. I did still catch the occasional show here and there, but I'm skipping forward because I am not joking when I say that for these few years, I fell asleep to Let's Plays and Build tutorials instead of TV. The TV in my room was unplugged for probably close to five years. Like, I got that thing in, like, sixth grade, and the original batteries for the remote only died a couple weeks ago. I think that it would be most fair to say that I got back into TV towards the end of high school. And this time, I was doing it in style. Cable? Cable's the bad guy, I'm not helping him. Nah, fuck programming blocks and spending quality time with my family on the couch. Pfft, this shit's getting streamed directly to me, I got no reason not to sit in my room and stare at my monitor all day. Where'd you go? Right after my family got Hulu, I was scrolling through, just taking stock of what it had, when, lo and behold... <gasps> my boy. Thus, my grand return to anime had to be begun, with a lap through Naruto. All of it this time. All of it. Even the filler. All... All 720 episodes. What the fuck is that? Whilst I was taking my victory lap for finishing Naruto, I realized, oh fuck, I have no idea what to watch next. Well, I like Naruto a lot, so why not something like it? So I sat down to have a good think, and I remembered that I had seen a couple episodes of Bleach before. Coincidentally, they happened to be the last episodes of Ichigo's final fight with Aizen, and that fight looked fucking sick, so I was super hyped to get there. I then dropped Bleach long before getting there. Bleach fans, you had better come strapped. Cause I will. However, comma, the sentiment was still there. I wanted to chase that Naruto high, and nothing was stopping me. A yada yada something about withdrawals, and a guy with a headband in a back alley, and we end up in a spot where I was addicted to Battle Shonen. Please, make me your beautiful 
It was the birth of a monster. All right, listen here, motherfucker. I know my taste is shit. I don't need you shitting on me. I can handle that myself. Loser! You're a loser! Are you feeling sorry for yourself? Well, you should be, cause you are dirt! You make me sick! Big baby? Baby want a bottle? Big dirt bottle? Why are you yelling at me? I don't care. You cannot tell me that this shit isn't fucking awesome. Who doesn't like watching people just beat the shit out of each other? I know the length is a turnoff for some people, but it allows the worlds in these shows to evolve much slower and more naturally. The world of a 13 episode anime just simply can't evolve in the same way or at the same pace as one with hundreds of episodes. Which one's better? It's up to you, but you can't deny that the fact that One Piece can take a line of dialogue that was made in passing, go well over 600 fucking episodes without ever mentioning it, and then build an entire arc around that one line is nothing short of an act of divine intervention. Yes, the length did used to come packaged with long filler and pacing so slow that you needed painkillers to get through it. See Dragon Ball Z's pacing and Naruto's nearly 50% filler percentage. But these problems weren't always guaranteed. One Piece starts out kinda slow, but it hits its stride early on, and its lap time just keeps getting better and better. And for coming up on a thousand episodes, its filler percentage is impressively low. Plus half the filler is integrated so well that I didn't even realize it was filler. So, I'd like to make the argument that it's more of a case-by-case -case issue, but I realize that that's a moot point because it's still a problem that really only Shonen deals with, so no one's gonna be convinced to pick up a multi-hundred episode just because it might be case-by-case. -case. Thankfully, these problems have for the most part gone away with the advent of seasonal anime. Studios have realized that, hey, if we just wait, we can preserve the integrity of our show and artificially inflate the demand for the next season. The last thing that people tend to rag on Shonen for is its emotional quality. Fair, Shonen can admittedly be real meatheady at times. When your main emotions are hype and blood rush, the comparison to something like Anohana doesn't exist. And yeah, these shows may not have the make people cry Katie that Anohana does, but that doesn't mean they can never get emotional. It would appear that... I never defeated you. Not even once. What are you talking about? Come on, we're just getting started. Perhaps. Plus, there are more ways to make a scene emotionally impactful than just through sadness. Gon's breakdown is without a doubt the most powerful scene of any media I have personally witnessed. He spends so much of the show writing his breaking point, but when he finally goes past it, the world conspires against him to prevent him not only from taking action that might ease his pain, but from doing essentially anything. Watching Gon struggle as this helpless ball of pure unbridled wrath who just has to sit there and stare left me honestly more speechless than I've ever been in my entire life. I had so many things I wanted to say at once that I couldn't focus on any one thought enough to form a sentence. My sister and I both just quietly got up to cool off and process between episodes, and it took like a good five minutes before I was finally able to say, Wow, that was a really good episode. And that would end up being the only thing I managed to say about it, despite everything else I wanted to say. If Hunter x Hunter can fuck me up like that, I have a hard time going along with the idea that Shonen is just mindless action. Fights don't just happen for the sake of the fight. Each one has a story to tell. Speaking of which, it's about time we talk about what draws everybody in. The fights, baby. Oh, the fucking fights. This is when the studio just gets to fucking flex. Oh, and when the animation drops, you know some anime just poured their entire heart into a scene that might only last seconds. Oh god, I'm at full mast right now. I quickly mentioned it earlier, but a show's ability to tell a worthless story through a fight is captivating. This hits even closer to home for me since I have a background in wrestling and have at least somewhat experienced this firsthand. Sometimes you come out of a match like, damn, that was a good match, I respect the shit out of you. But sometimes it's like, nah, fuck you, you're a piece of shit. You could have won both matches and never have said a word to either opponent, but you just gotta vibe off them during the match and you almost feel like you know them. This goes kind of underappreciated, but there is a story to each match. When you step onto the mat and shake hands with the person across from you, the world around you just falls away. Both of you are fighting to win and move forward despite whatever the other person's story might be. For the six minutes of that match, all you know is the mat, the ref, your coach, you and them. There isn't a crowd, there's no bleachers, you're just stuck in this physically draining tug of war with your opponent as you go back and forth trying to pin each other, and if you give up your focus to anything but the match, you're going to lose. I've been having my ass kicked all match only for instinct to take over and take advantage of a split second opening that I couldn't even see, ending in a huge comeback win for our team. I had someone fake cry against one of my friends to get them to loosen their grip a little bit, and then they turned the position around on them and beat them, so when they tried to pull the same shit on me two matches later, I just squeezed harder. 
One of my friends went against another guy on our team who told him that if he beat him fast enough, his parents would take him to dinner wherever he wanted. So my friend slammed him with all his weight behind him for a massive W. Sorry, sorry, getting off track. The point is, these are real things that happen, and I love it when a show gets it right. Fights like Kakashi vs. Obito or Gon vs. Hisuka show just how little needs to be said to get the story behind the fight across. If you don't know the story behind either of these fights, you'll learn them during it. And besides storytelling, fights also give fans more ways to discuss a show. Power scaling, versus battles, discussing how obscure powers work. I actually think that Superman is a fundamentally terrible character. A terrible character that can also be destroyed by Ben 10 and his cancer-derived <laughs> abilities. <laughs> Nonetheless, semicolon, I recognize the importance of building a solid resume to look good in front of future employers. My viewing habits may be dominated by Shonen, as evidenced by the episode count. Eesh. Someone needs to go outside. But I've done a mediocre to okay job of spreading it to the other genres that anime has to offer. As you would expect, I started with shows closest to what I was already watching, like your Kawaii Bebop and Helsing Ultimates, and then I worked my way out from there. Surprisingly though, it was only a few shows before I was watching stuff like Serial Experiments Lane and Gunkutsuo. Now I don't know how many of you keep track of the genres of the show you watch, but that was not something I was thinking about in the slightest. Anime is incredibly diverse, so sometimes it could be a struggle to be any more specific than, this is a show with characters. I'm not trying to write a research paper every time I want to categorize a show. Some shows aren't clear which genres they fall into beyond broad ones like action, and it's not worth the time trying to hunt down the exact defining characteristics of every possible genre. So, I use my own patent pending system. It's simple, here, I'll walk you through it. There's only two categories. Category 1, fighting shows. If the focus of the show is on the fights, it goes here. Category 2, shows that have a story to tell or a message to send, aka literally everything else. Yes, this does mean that Devilman Crybaby is in the same category as Bakano and Fuli Cooley. I don't see the problem. Operating on a genre-wide basis just isn't helpful. I don't want to accidentally close myself off to a show I might like just because I don't like other shows in the genre. I don't like Isekai, but ReZero's quality is undoubtedly top tier, and Konosuba's hilarious. So I'd rather work on a show-by-show -show basis and not make a blanket ban of every show in a given genre. But I couldn't stop myself from doing it once. I need to preface this with, I am a pussy. I am not a man's man. I do not have the views nor the thick calloused hands of a man's man, but I wanted nothing to do with Slice of Life. If you've been paying close attention, yes, this does seem contradictory to a couple things I said earlier. That's because it is, but let's break it down. I'm gonna come out swinging kinda strong here, but I thought I had to be a pussy to watch Slice of Life. Whoa, 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 whoa hey buddy, set it down, all right? Just give me a chance, okay? I don't know if a pitchfork's here, just gonna have to Imagine. Don't imagine setting it down, though. Please, please actually do that. That's not to say that I thought Slice of Life fans were pussies. I was judging myself, not them. I couldn't give a shit what someone else watches. I mean, what a waste of energy. Actually, who fucking cares? So if I wasn't judging other people for liking Slice of Life, why would I have judged myself? Well, really, the only thing I knew about Slice of Life was that whenever I heard someone talking about a show that made them cry, it was Slice of Life. In spite of that horribly limited knowledge of the genre, we have our problem. For the vast majority of my life, I had a problem with film and crying. I don't cry that often as is, thankfully not because I'm emotionally repressed, but for a positive reason. I spend damn near every day just shooting the shit with my friends and playing video games for too long. We're all comfortable with ourselves. We know how to laugh at ourselves and our problems, so we can spend the day roasting the shit out of each other and be closer for it, because in the end, we know that it's a loving and endearing roast. So is it more efficient to have drillers like two spaces apart or i i say no i say liam's wrong and have them together no 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 because liam liam you're fucking dumb so despite how often i make a joke at my own expense it truly is rare that i actually feel down how are your problems supposed to bother you if you can turn them into a joke and laugh about them 
I can count the number of times I remember crying in my life on a single hand. The funerals of both my great-grandparents, telling my wrestling coach I was quitting, and getting dumped. These were the times in my life when there wasn't a brighter side to look at. There was nothing to laugh about. I have close to a triple digit number of family members that get together every holiday, and the deaths of my great grandparents rocked each and every one of them. I'm not making a joke about the situation, you'd have to be out of your fucking mind to think I would. The only way there was to work through it was to cry and grieve. If situations like those were the only times in my life where I cried, I'd have been ashamed of myself for crying from a TV show or a movie. I mean, how embarrassing to cry over a 13 episode cartoon, a mere 5 hours, and to give that the same emotional weight as the death of my great grandmother who I knew for 20 years. A normal person, of course, understands that that's not how that works, but I'm neither normal nor people, so here we are. I'm not. 100% sure what my problem was, but the result was essentially that I prevented myself from forming emotional connections with TV and movies. If I watched a sad movie or there was an emotional scene in a show, I kinda just wouldn't feel anything. If I was watching the movie with other people, sometimes they'd ask me, you don't find this sad? How are you not tearing up? What's wrong with you? I'd always tell them, A hey, might be, I've got messed up tear ducts. Cause I did have a surgery on one of my tear ducts when I was young, but I was just using that as an excuse. My tear ducts are fine, they work normally. But since I kept using them as an excuse, I convinced myself that I wasn't capable of crying, barring only the most emotional moments in my life. I think I was always subconsciously aware of this problem too, but as we've seen, I surrounded myself with shows where I wouldn't have to confront the problem. I still hold that Battle Shonen can be just as emotional as any other genre, but it's a lot easier to dissociate and ignore an emotional scene when one only comes around every 40 episodes. And that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to confront the problem, I was barely even aware of its existence. I didn't want to go find myself. The only thing I wanted to feel was my blood rushing as Rockley opens the fifth gate. Deep down, I knew there were shows in Slice of Life that would force me to confront my problem. I didn't want to fucking deal with it. So the entire genre was off the table. But when you're avoiding dealing with a problem that you're only vaguely aware of, you don't want to talk about it or you don't even want to mention it exists. So I needed excuses for why I hated a genre I knew nothing about. There's the joke that Slice of Life is just cute girls doing cute things. And while, well, yeah, it kinda is, people actually watching these shows know that's just a joke and that in reality, that's a gross generalization of the genre. But I don't watch these shows. So even though I recognize the statement as a joke, part of me also took it at face value and I used that to judge the genre. I convinced myself that the genre wasn't worth watching since there wouldn't be any story or goals. If the show didn't have a place it was trying to get to, why waste my time watching it drift aimlessly? Roadblock number two was that I saw these shows as all being carbon copies of each other, I'd say as a Battle Shonen fan. But whereas I could differentiate different Battle Shonen by their worlds, power systems, casts, and stories, I couldn't see the unique characteristics of Slice of Life. What I saw was the same high school club setting, the same cast of characters, the same already explored ideas, all on repeat. The final hurdle was a small one just meant to trip anyone in front of the finish line. I took a Super Eye Patch Wolf video too seriously and started criticizing Slice of Life for having bad character design because their characters don't pass the silhouette test. God, I'm a jackass. All in all, some pretty sturdy walls I put up for myself despite the lack of foundation. Hell, their structural integrity was how I got through Anohana without crying. Now, you might be thinking, oh, it was at least close, right? I sat there stoic, not even the thought of a tear. In case you're wondering, the closest I had come to crying was Jojo. That's not a joke. Look man, I don't make the rules. The walls were holding out so well that Mexico thanked me and even offered to pay for them, but then something unexpected happened. I am a sucker for a good video essay. I love wasting the day watching different show analyses pretending that I don't have work I should be doing. One day, I was aimlessly scrolling through random anime video essays when I came up on an anime chain to the past. Yo, I love Cowboy Bebop, run it. I had never heard about Sing Yesterday for me before watching this video, but it had me pissed that I was in the middle of another show because I wanted to watch it right now. Thankfully, like Anohana, Sing Yesterday for me was far enough away from that stereotypical image I had of Slice of Life that my internal alarm never went off, so it was able to go straight to the top of my plan to watch list. I don't think I could have watched it at a better time in my life either. If you're watching anime on your computer or at your desk, you're doing it wrong. That's how I used to watch, and all it did was help exaggerate the problem I had creating emotional connections with shows. Sitting still in an office chair pretty quickly becomes not that comfortable. 
Trying to build a connection with the show then only becomes more difficult when I keep getting taken out of it because my ass went numb and I need to change positions again. Couple that with the fact that I'm on my computer so part of my brain wants to procrastinate everything and just scroll through YouTube, and another obstacle's found. Though, this one's more of a hardware issue than a software one. It was while I was watching the Thrill of Bark arc of One Piece that I realized that my interest in the show varied wildly depending on my comfort that night. If I had been playing games with my friends for a couple hours and then I tried to watch a couple episodes, it was like I wasn't even watching them because I was so worried about changing positions and getting comfortable that I just couldn't focus on the show. I wanted to be more invested in the shows that I was watching, so I plugged the TV in my room back in and started watching anime in my bed. This made an immeasurable difference, leading to this magical moment where I got a runner's high watching TV for the first time in my life. A runner's high is a sensation you get when you've been running for an extended period of time and you aren't able to focus on or think about anything other than moving your body. Go a little longer and you hit a point where you become aware of your inability to think about anything other than running. And now the only thing you can think about is how you can't think about anything. When that happens, it feels like taking a step out of your body, almost as if you're watching yourself run from a step back. Honestly, it's a really euphoric feeling that can come up in other places, it just happens to be so easy to get while exercising. One of the weird places that it came up for me was watching anime from my bed. Whereas before I was struggling to give shows enough attention, I almost 180 to giving them too much. Now I get so absorbed in a show that I tunnel vision on the TV. The rest of my room is in my field of view, but I don't see the other things in my room. My brain doesn't process them. I become unaware of my body, my bed, my dresser, the things on my dresser. My TV and Xbox both have an LED on when they're on, but I can't remember ever noticing either of those during an episode. Instead, I sink into my bed and I get lost in the story. So now, in comes Sing Yesterday for me, the first quote-unquote emotional show I watched since making the Switch. This show utterly blindsided me. I had my guard down, I put myself in a position where I was building emotional connections to shows for the first time, and I saw too much of myself in the main character. Normally when I watched a show, I would just sit still looking at the show, but in a new experience to me, I found myself moving with the show. I smiled when the characters smiled. I laughed when they laughed, hurt when they hurt, and most importantly, cried when they cried. I was involved in the show. When I finally got the fuck over myself and opened up a bit, something weird happened. The second to last episode put me on the verge of tears, and the last one got me to finally crack, but I noticed that instead of fighting to hold back the tears, I was kind of trying to force them out. I wanted to cry. I kind of felt like I needed to, like I was going to be disappointed in myself if I didn't and all at once I was forced to reassess my views on Slice of Life. Why did I want to cry? Was this one just an outlier or are they all like this? Do I go deeper or do I ignore that this happened? I legitimately spent at least 10 minutes sitting in silence in my room just processing. Now if you're expecting me to instantly change from how I was to Hurry! Hurry! I'm a big fan! Sorry, but no shot. When people hold a strong opinion for that long just to be proven wrong, they're almost never willing to change their perspective right away. They'd rather hold on to their flawed view than admit they were wrong. The same was true for me. I wasn't going to ignore what had happened, but when it came to deciding whether this was an outlier or not, my hypothesis was that it was. I needed to test my hypothesis, so I picked up a place further than the universe, resolving not to cry. This one isn't quite the high schooler sitting in the club room type beat I was so strongly against, but it's definitely close, fitting the cute girls do cute things bill no problem. So if my criticisms of the genre were to hold up at all, Getting through this show should be the easiest W of my life. I am now 0 for 2 against Slice of Life. Once again, I found myself forced to confront my perception, but this time I didn't have the option to write it off as a one-off. I had to accept the fact that these shows are the exact type of shit that I love. Yes, lack of an overarching plot or goals for the story are defining characteristics of Slice of Life, but I didn't understand what that meant. Lack of plot doesn't mean lack of story, it just means a character-driven narrative, you fucking idiot. I love character-driven stories. This whole thing started because I clicked on a video because its title reminded me of Cowboy Bebop. I've said it before, the characters are the most important part of a show. In a previous video, I basically said that you don't really even need a story as long as your characters are fun to watch. No, I will not be playing the clip because I sound like a teacher whose semester is made when they use a word not on the slides. I'm a firm believer that the most important aspect of a show is its characters. <sighs> God damn it. I believe that though. Obviously, I still want a good story for the characters to go through, but if all you got is cool characters, shit, dog, I'll take it. I'm describing Slice of Life. I am telling you that Slice of Life is a perfect fit for me. I don't know where the blending together issue came from either. I was worried that I wouldn't be able to recognize different shows in their cast because they look similar? Man, shut the fuck up. For starters, 
The high school setting is so common because going through school is one of the most universally relatable experiences. And high school is just the oldest you can make them while still maintaining that relatability. It's an incredibly safe assumption that any random viewer of your show went through high school and can relate to that setting. The same isn't true for a show about the daily life of an electrician. Most people have never been an electrician. Secondly, the characters look similar because they're meant to be real people, not magic ninjas or grim reapers. And, uh, newsflash, the Great Khali and Yoel Romero are about the only two people who pass the silhouette test. Finally, this is just a non-issue. There's an entire sector of my brain dedicated to remembering character names. Name some people from class 1B. 1B? Everyone um, cares about 1B. Tetsu 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 Tetsu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. So now you're probably thinking, okay, well, if you went through these realizations, surely you're ready to admit that you like these shows. <laughs> oh, you, you've not been watching this video, have you? Sure. I was now in a position where I was beginning to realize how much I enjoyed these shows and how much I had missed out on. But I'm a petty little bitch that holds a grudge. Being as wrong as I was for as long as I was doesn't feel great. So I wasn't quite ready to openly admit to being a fan of the genre. But it would only take one more show to blow it all wide open and get me to finally come around. The question, then, is what was it? Yeah, it was Kaon. Pure poetic justice. The exact type of show that I didn't want to watch ended up being the one to turn me into a fan. And come on, how would it not? Kaon's overflowing with style. Dude, I just fucking love this show. It's funny, it knows how to put a smile on your face, and if you'll let it, it'll show you exactly how hard you can cry. At first when I finished it, I was like, damn, solid show. That was a lot of fun. But I don't think it was even near my top 10. But I can't stop thinking about it. Every time I think about it, I end up moving it up another spot in my rankings. The only reason it hasn't gone any higher is I've run out of shows I can knock down. I just need more of that Hank and Dale relationship that Ritsu and Mio have. Ritsu, I oughta kick your ass. Hmm. I am realizing now that I have created a plot hole. You might be wondering if I was having such a hard time opening up to the genre, why would I pick up K-On next, seeing as it perfectly fits the description of show I wanted to hate? Well, it's a simple answer. You're, you're gonna think this is a joke, I, I promise this isn't a bit, it's, it's the truth. Bro, look at this fucking steal I got on the box set. Would've been a waste of money not to buy it. The painfully ironic part to all of this is that a couple of years ago, I had a friend recommend and offer to watch K-On with me. My problem could've potentially been solved years earlier if I had been willing to cave for a friend. But instead, I told him to go fuck himself, disgusted that he would even suggest it. I didn't have the time to waste on some wholesome feel-good show without action. I got hand signs to memorize and Naruto won't become the Hokage. Serpent, Ram, Monkey, Boar, Horse, Tiger. You know, it's times like this that really remove the mystery of why I'm single. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, hey, you know, if there's any goth chicks watching this. Please, I need this. Realistically, though, that's the worst thing you'll ever hear about Kaon. It's not for me. I was content thinking that, but I couldn't be happier that I got into Slice of Life. With that, we finally get to the reason why I made this video. Initially, I only planned for this to be my thoughts on Kaon, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that Kaon represented something more to me. There's a thousand videos out there breaking down Kaon and why it's a good show, but I don't think reducing a show to a bullet point list of what it does right captures the whole picture, and besides, none of the reasons on that list are why it's special to me. It's the show that I directly credit as making me a Slice of Life fan. How do you quantify that? My attempt to quantify it was to give you my life story, hoping that by understanding who I am as a person, my viewing habits, my views on the genre, you might understand just how insane it is that Kaon changed my plan to watch list from this to this. And you want to know how I looked at the genre? Down on. I thought Slice of Life shows were boring, mundane, uneventful, all the same. But I was wrong. You can have a Slice of Life show about a girl who's used as a machine for the military, trying to learn how to feel through telling other stories. Or what if God was a girl in high school that didn't know she was God and kept almost collapsing the space-time continuum. Or a story about a girl who can turn her blood into a sword and a half-man, half-monster uniting over being outcast and its fetish for classes. How did I ever think concepts like those were boring, dull, or in any way the same? Yeah, the show that got me hooked on the genre, and the only reason I watched any of those, 
was closest to what I was trying to avoid. A few months ago, Slice of Life looked to me like a bunch of shows that all look like k -On, and I would have confidently said that they all had the same story. But I was wrong. None of the shows I've seen so far hit the same beats. Anohana covers Survivor's Guilt. March comes in like a lion covers trying to open back up after closing yourself off from the world. And k -On covers making club with strangers, growing close, and having fun. Those few months ago, I thought it was impossible for a show to make me cry. That it was going to take nothing short of a miracle for a show to make me cry. Well, shit. Maybe Haruhi was right, and God really is an anime girl in high school, because flash forward to the present day, and more slice of life shows have made me cry than haven't. k -On even made lightning strike in the same place twice. It got me with the ending, and again with the movie, which is just the same fucking ending again, but that didn't stop me from crying even more the second time. And yet, the ending of k -On isn't something I would necessarily describe as overly sad, but rather beautifully bittersweet. You know the journey has to come to an end, but you don't want it to. The girls will still be friends, They'll still be going to school together, the band's still going to be making music, but this chapter of their lives has to come to an end. Then it sneaks up on you. Fuck. No. Go back. Go back. I'm not ready for it to end yet. There hasn't been any big plot twists or subversions, no huge story arcs. You've just been watching highlight reels of people's days. But you realize you've got a connection with the characters, and you don't want it to end. You just want the show to keep going exactly as it is so you can have just a little more time with it. But you know you can't have that, because this is the perfect way for the show to end. And as they put everything they have into that last song, you start crying. Not because you're sad, but because you're thankful. And... That's new to me. I watched 720 episodes of Naruto. By sheer time invested, I was more attached to Naruto's universe than Kaon's. But I didn't cry when Naruto's journey came to an end. One Piece is going to be well over a thousand episodes before it's done and I've got a sneaking suspicion that I won't be crying when or if it does finally come to an end. Yet this little show about a group of girls starting a band got me. I completely missed the lyrics to the front half of the song because I was so taken up in the moment that I forgot I had to be reading them. I was crying just from hearing it. So I don't know, man. There is telling a story with fighting, but, but there's also telling a story with crying. Who knows? Maybe you do have to be a pussy to watch these shows. If that's true, then I'm the biggest bitch of them all. More than I was already. I've had so many great little in-the-moment experiences since I let myself open up. Going back and rewatching Anohana with my sisters, ending with all three of us quietly crying over the last episode. Setting a land speed record while watching March Comes In Like a Lion for the fastest any human has gone from completely dry eyes, no buildup, to full-on crying. Six seconds. And yes, I did cry a little again while timing that. Just look, here's every slice of life show I've seen. And here are all the ones that made me cry. That's an 70% cry rate. Here's another little funny quirk about this list. It's also every anime that's made me cry. Infinity Train stopping me from saying every show that made me cry, but exception aside, no other genre has been able to do it yet. It makes me wonder how much I've missed out on because I couldn't get over myself. Stoically sitting through these shows without ever feeling the slightest emotion shouldn't be a badge you wear with pride. You're not a man. You're a husk. Don't get me wrong, I still love watching people beat the shit out of each other, but... I don't know, man. Slice of life? It's kinda where it's at. <laughs> kinda giving you horrible lighting here. That's good enough. But... Why do I look like that? No, seriously, which one of you assholes living outside looking like that? That's fucked up. This whole outro's fucked up. When did you record this? Okay, uh, this bit was funny when I thought of it, but not come, we're doing a serious one. This video has been a, uh, a bit of a journey. I mean, both in the context of the journey I go on throughout the actual video, but in the making of itself, too. I mean, I've been working on this video for two and a half years at this point. I've lived a lot of life during that time. I transferred out of community college. I graduated from actual college. I've gone on multiple trips across the country to see some old friends. i have in love, out of love. I interviewed my favorite band. I mean, it's just countless memories I've made all while having this video on the back burner at the same time. I mean, hell, I lived out of my car for a couple weeks there. This has my full legal name on it, doesn't it? Okay, so setting that aside as a prop. Yeah, I mean, it's just be weird to not have this like a constant nag in the back of my head anymore. And it's not like I'm proud of how long the video took either, but 
at a certain point, some sort of perfectionism just took over because, I mean, with my previous videos, I don't know, it's, they're just missing something, you know? Like, they're not in a state where I can really, truly be proud of them. Either I find that I'm going in circles, not really talking about anything, or I just didn't end up saying what I set out to say, or I just didn't say anything at all, really. So with this one, I really wanted to take the time and make sure that I had something to say. I talked about what I wanted to talk about, and, you know, I think I accomplished my goal. Instead of just trying to talk about whatever random bullshit, I picked a topic that was special to me. You know, it was something that I went through, something I could relate to, something I was passionate about. And I feel like I've ended up telling, I mean, at least what I hope is a somewhat compelling story. I know the journey is not unique to me. It's something plenty of other people have gone through and will go through. But I've told in a way where it's built upon my life experiences and I can feel like I've told my story. You know, maybe someone in a similar situation can take something away from it, learn something from it. But at the end of the day, I have a final product that I can be truly proud of. I can be happy with it and want to share it. And I know in the future, I'll still be proud of it. And that's just something I haven't had yet. I could ramble on for a while here, so I'll cut it off here and just say thank you. I really do appreciate you giving me your time going on this journey with me. I mean, especially for making it this far. You know, I'm happy knowing that just anyone is watching the video. It's pay off for the last couple years of work. So really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I'll see you guys in another couple of years. Michael, thank if you. it was a girl, it'd be called a Kanoichi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh wait, there's hollow beat Mighty Bean cards? I had no clue. It's just a hollow. <laughs> is that a fucking Karibo? No, it's a know. petite angel, come on. Oh. <laughs> I know you're dyslexic, but read. God, just read! Is that, is that Karibo? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just, every now and then, I like just doing the bit and just being like, roll for initiative. <laughs> <laughs> space on my phone. Please, no, stop. You're zooming. I can see your hands, but stop. Just, hey. Bleach fans, you had better come strapped. Because I will. Fuck, I fucking pinched my pinky with that. Ow. Fuck. Uh, work through it. The show must go on. Oh, that door skin. Yes, you know I'm being like... Way too cautious for the bit to work because I fucking hit myself. He was a little blood blister. It looks like I got a mole there, but like I don't. Don't hit yourself with the flail, kids. <laughs> I feel like the fucking Joker recording laughs. What the fuck is going on? Yeesh. Someone needs to go outside. What the fuck was that? Yeesh. Someone might need to go outside. Okay, those are all shit. Loser! You're a loser! Are you feeling sorry for yourself? Well, you should be, because you make me... Fuck, damn it, damn it, damn it. We need a little bit of a story, so... Why don't you do it for a little trip down memory lane? That was the most contrived one I've done yet. <gasps> My boy. This video has been a, uh... bit of a journey. I've been working on this for... No, I already fucking hate it. <sighs> this is all the scripts. Two and a half years at this point, and that's a lot of time. I lived a lot of life during that. Why is talking so fucking hard? This is so easy, and I'm making it so hard. Really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And I'll see you guys in a couple more years. <laughs> Why the fuck would I salute? Plot points. Both these aspects were then capitalized on the laws. God. Damn it. I don't have the lungs for this. I can't keep taking attempts at this. The most animation that I was used to was the outline on the edit and... Fucking... Fucking... God damn it. The most animation that I was used to was the outline on edit and it... Fuck. Fuck. 
Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Sasuke. The third, the third, the third thing. I had never heard about Sing Yesterday for me before watching this video. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's, tank's not gonna work. Do I look like I know what a JPEG is?